the human organization, memory, and inner reading. I spoke here a while ago of what we call esoteric reading and esoteric hearing. Today and tomorrow I will add to those discussions, and in doing so we'll develop several important ideas about our building. If we look at external scientific observation today, insofar as it is relevant to the life of the soul, we find many difficulties with it as soon as we attempt to get a satisfactory overview of the pertinent concepts. One difficulty, which is truly not a small one, results when we look at the external sciences observation of human memory. Now I would have to adduce a great deal if I wanted to give an account of what external psychology or doctrine of the soul can say about the memory of human beings. That would not lead us very far, but I do want to make you aware of where the difficulty lies for external psychology when it comes to understanding memory and its characteristics. It is true, is it not, that human memory shows itself to us in such a way that we can call back into consciousness at a later time thoughts, concepts and ideas that we have received at any time in the past. This spiritual fact is therefore obvious. Today, for example, we can have any kind of perception or experience and after a certain time, without standing in front of what originally elicited the perception or experience, we can make the conception or experience of the original fact live once again from within, out of ourselves. It appears then as if the human soul in some way stores up in itself everything it receives from without. Thus, when we become acquainted with someone, we have an impression of that person, which we transform into a concept and store as a conceptual image in our subconscious. When we need it, we call it back again. From this point of view, it might seem obvious that our soul, in so far as it develops the power of our memory, is, let us say, like a box, in which we can put away and store all concepts and experiences, taking them out again when we need to call them up into consciousness. All possible experiences would be stored in the cupboard of the soul, and it would be possible to call them up once again from there. Indeed, when we read books today discussing memory, we get the impression that the authors often believe the soul is really such a storage cupboard for all possible experiences. Just think, you walk around with your soul and carry with you a cupboard for all your impressions and experiences. But here we must admit immediately that a difficulty presents itself. Attempts have been made to bridge over this difficulty with all sorts of scientific concepts, but nothing particularly satisfying has emerged. Indeed, this difficulty can be overcome finally only by acquiring a deeper insight into the fourfold articulation of the human being, into the physical body, the etheric body, the astral body, and the capital I. To attain real knowledge of the nature of human memory, we must study the human etheric and astral bodies. Let us begin by forming, through a comparison, a concept of what the astral body of the human being actually is. Isn't it true that in everyday waking life we do not experience ourselves in the astral body any more than we experience ourselves in the etheric body. From waking up until going to sleep, we experience ourselves in our I, and thus all experiences are I experiences. <coughs> we do not experience ourselves in the astral body, which is in fact infinitely wiser than the I person. It is capable of much more than the I person is. This astral body can read, 
really read what I have described for you as esoteric writing. So, in addition to many other concepts that can give us an understanding of the astral body, it is also a reader of esoteric writing. On the other hand, the etheric body is, among many other things, something like a tablet upon which esoteric writing is engraved through the processes of the world. While we live, and we are always living, whether in waking and sleeping, between birth and death, or between death and a new birth, processes are constantly occurring in the universe. Events unfold in the cosmos. The essential lives in the cosmos, and all of it replicates itself, inscribes itself in the etheric body. The human etheric body, in fact, truly replicates the whole cosmos. There is nothing in the cosmos that does not imprint an image of itself in the etheric body of the human being and mirror itself in the imagination. And the human astral body constantly reads what the world inscribes in the etheric body. This process proceeds in the human subconscious, where the human astral body reads what the world inscribes in the human etheric body. <clears throat> Even in our conscious waking life, when we encounter an event or an object that makes an impression on us, we form a concept of it. The astral body is first occupied with this formation of the concept. It is in active movement while we are forming a concept of an object or of the impression of an external event. What we form in this way as a concept, what we have as an experience in the soul, is also inscribed in our etheric body. Just as the world with its events is constantly inscribing itself in our etheric body, so we also inscribe in our etheric body what we ourselves experience in our soul. There it remains inscribed. Thus when we remember something, a complicated process takes place. Our astral body reads what has been inscribed in our etheric body. And the result of this reading is that an idea forces its way up to the surface, which we call memory. In this way, memory can be traced back to a way of reading our astral body in the etheric body. And as soon as we know this, we can no longer entertain the simplistic idea that the soul is a storage cupboard for what we have experienced. Rather, we will understand that in fact, when it has experienced something, the astral body transforms itself over and over into a few habits and then impresses these into the etheric body. Parenthesis, I say literally, quote, habits, close quote. Tomorrow we will understand this word better, close parenthesis. Just as our writing system has few letters, our astral body has few, very few habits. And just as we communicate the whole infinite fullness of what human beings have to say about themselves and the world with a few letters through different written combinations, so what memory stores is formed through the combination of a few habits. When we know that the process is a kind of reading, we will no longer believe that each individual experience must be inscribed. Rather, a few habits of the astral body are combined and then fixed in the etheric body. Just as when we hear a new word, we are able to set it down with the old letters, we can set down each new experience in the etheric body with a few habits of the astral body. This reality stems from the fact that our etheric and especially our astral bodies are linked with the entire cosmos. We must not take what an older wisdom teaching has lifted out of the cosmos so simply as something lifted out by chance 
Rather, it has a deep meaning and importance. If we consider the twelve signs of the complete zodiac, we can say that in fact our astral body is in living connection with these twelve signs. They signify for the astral body twelve particular habits, twelve particular ways of being in movement. And as we have often discussed, our astral body is likewise also connected with the seven planets. These also determine certain habits in the astral body. Again, I say literally, habits. Through these habits, which are ignited in our astral body by the planets of our solar system, something arises in the astral body that is similar to the vowels. And through the habits, similarly stimulated by the influence of the zodiac, something arises in the astral body that is similar to the consonants. Let us assume that our astral body, at some particular moment in life, is connected with the powers that flow from the sign of Aries. There are always such moments, because we are always connected with the world. Because our astral body stands in connection with or under the influence of what flows out of the sign of Aries, the possibility develops in the astral body to close itself off, to give itself a boundary. And conversely, when the astral body is rather under the influence of Libra, a movement develops in it that leaves it more open to the whole world. In this way, a different particular tendency toward movement develops under the influence of each of the signs of the zodiac. Under the influence of this or that sign, the astral body stretches its upper part, especially loftily upward. Under the influence of one of the other signs, it extends its lower part. Twelve such particular ways of movement give twelve corresponding habits and seven further particular habits are given under the influence of the planets. The habits under the influence of the planets are more inner movements, through which the inner parts move or bring themselves into a relationship with one another. So, basically, our astral body has been planted through the cosmos with 12 plus 7 equals 19 habits. Just as with our alphabet, through combinations of the signs for the vowels and consonants, we can indicate everything we bring to light with our wisdom and wish to express, so too our astral body forms everything it has to form through the combinations of these nineteen habits. Just as with our alphabet, through combinations of the signs for the vowels and consonants, we can indicate everything we bring to light with our wisdom and wish to express, so too our astral body forms everything it has to form through the combinations of these nineteen habits. When a person approaches us with a face that regards us benevolently or with hostility in a particular way, our astral body makes particular movements that are combined from these nineteen habits. The movements are inscribed in the etheric body, and then, at a later time, the astral body can reread what is inscribed there. That is the foundation of memory. As soon as we go beyond what the senses and the intellect bind to the senses, we come immediately to the relationship of human beings to the cosmos. But the physical body conceals this relationship of the human being to the cosmos. We, therefore, possess a continuous inner reading. And if we could go back, even historically, to the origins of writing, we would find that, in fact, this inner reading of human beings is imitated in the oldest human logographic systems. It is not true that writing systems arose somehow by chance. The original symbols for the consonants 
were imitations of the signs of the zodiac. And the original signs for the vowels were imitations of the images of the planets. External reading was nothing other than an imitation in the outer world of what human beings possessed as inner reading. This is connected to the mentality of earlier times regarding literature. Because it was drawn from cosmic secrets, literature was regarded as something especially holy. We know that in ancient excuse me, we know yes, that in ancient Egyptian culture, for example, when the scribes made mistakes, they exposed themselves under the strict laws of the country, according to the magnitude of the error, to the most painful punishments. Indeed, even sometimes if the error were great enough to the death penalty. To write down what people could know of the holy secrets was regarded as something infinitely high and holy, because people still had a feeling of the connection of the written sign and all the holy secrets of human nature to the divine. The important thing as we gradually absorb spiritual science is to receive once again the feeling of the sacred in the hidden aspects of human nature. This feeling is much more important than the mere theoretical absorption of spiritual scientific things. Along with this feeling, however, comes the fact that when, in the course of their development, human beings gave up all connection with the holiness of writing, they felt that something dreadful was happening in the history of humanity. Take a book from the early Middle Ages in your hands and try to transport yourself into the situation in which such a book came into being. How a monk wrote for years, indeed decades in this book. How he painted one single letter for a long, long time. Then people knew that writing had so great a value that they had to consider it holy. They knew that through writing they stood in a relationship with the good gods and that what they entrusted to writing was to a certain extent drawn into the outer world from what came from the good gods. But you certainly know that a contemporary sign of human development is that everything that comes from the good gods can be shifted in the world into aramonic or luciferic directions. The entirely ordinary printer's art developed into the thing from which human beings primarily get their wisdom today. We get our information about what people think or do not think about the world and its secrets by leaning our heads over papers on which are wretched signs, signs that are now only imitations of the old written signs. The art of writing has been shifted from its true place. The nature of writing and communication has entered a new stage in which writing has lost all aura of the sacred. One could say that the aramonic stage of communication through writing has been entered. Ancient written signs in symbolism, even in imitation, were the drawing out into the outer world of hidden secrets corresponding to the nature of beings of the spiritual world who were progressing in a good sense. What we have today, especially in printed texts, but in a broader sense also in written texts, has a decidedly aramonic character. And people felt that this was so. Thus they attributed the printer's art to the dark powers, called it a, quote, black art, close quote, and indeed even attributed its invention to the devil. Nonetheless, the invention of the printer's art has a deeper significance, which we see in the way Goethe brings what Faust experiences in a certain phase of his life into relation with the printer's art. The aramonic period of communication appeared when the printer's art arrived. We know indeed that we must rightly learn not to cross ourselves before precisely all the things that are called aramonic, However, we also know that we should call things by their proper names and must understand them. 
We may not, as spiritual scientists, be among those who say that the art of printing is aramonic, and that we must therefore eliminate it. That we will not do, because we understand that the aramonic is also necessary in the development of the world, that it also belongs to the progress of the world. However, we must see things as they are. We must not reinterpret things in order to make ourselves feel more comfortable by attempting to live in the world without Araman or Lucifer. Perhaps it is more pleasant not to know that Araman is actually staring out at us from every modern book, but it is necessary for those who see the world in its true light to put up with this situation and not to transform it into something else. Learning to understand the world is the duty of those who feel themselves drawn to spiritual science. In our time we see an external natural science that would prefer to transform everything into a sort of mechanical movement of the smallest particles of matter. I have often spoken about the world view that makes an external science out of our world. It tells us that colors, red, yellow, green, violet, blue, are nothing but oscillations in reality, that color is only something the eye calls forth, E-Y-E. Red results from so and so many oscillations, yellow from so many, so and so many oscillations, blue from so many, and violet from so many. We could say that modern observers tend to delete what they perceive in the world from their world picture and put a material whirl in its place. One of the last great spirits who resisted what we can call a swirling dance of material particles, especially in the field of color theory, was Goethe. And because the modern world has constantly stepped closer and closer to this materialistic conception, this obliteration of what is around us as a complex world, we may not have, we have not been able to understand what Goethe really wanted to say in his theory of color. As spiritual science permeates humanity, it will once again bring some order into this area, and Goethe's color theory will come to be justly appreciated. Goethe no doubt saw it as a kind of petty madness, parenthesis, in his idiosyncratic expressions, he would perhaps have even said great madness, close parenthesis to think that the colors flowing through the world are nothing more than what the eye calls forth from a whirl of oscillations, from an oscillating cosmos. This oscillating cosmos, parenthesis, I have often called it a fantasy of recent natural science, close parenthesis, was simply not present for Goethe. For him it was one of Mephistopheles' seductions. Goethe, with his alert senses, was given over to the fullness of what was flowing with colors in this world. He lived in the streams of color. To hypothesize the awful vibrations of modern physics in place of this flowing sea of color would have seemed to him as the most barren gray theory. Why? Because Goethe had a healthy human nature in the most profound sense, developed on all sides, and was always striving to place himself in the correct relationship to the world. A healthy nature, such as Goethe's, also sleeps well. This statement appears to be very trivial, but it contains a significant piece of wisdom, for sleeping well actually means a great deal for the spiritual researcher. In sleep human beings are outside their physical and etheric bodies, present in their eye and their astral body, so that they are then really within the experiences that bring the astral body in relation, for example, with the entire starry cosmos. The cosmos illuminates everything in the astral body, which in turn can assert itself on the influences of the signs of the zodiac and the planets. <clears throat> Just as in a waking state, human beings live with the outer world, so in the sleeping state they live with the world of the stars. 
but we do not know very much about our life with the world of the stars. It is important to understand why we do not know much about this life together with the stars. Why actually don't we know? It is true, is it not, that we do not see a landscape when it is covered with fog. The fog flows over the landscape, and the elements of the landscape, the rivers, mountains, plains, and so on, do not appear to us when they are permeated with fog. In the same way, when they are asleep, human beings are permeated by a fog, a spiritual fog. What does this spiritual fog consist of? It is a fog of desires. It is composed of desires. And these desires are formed of the yearning for the physical body. When human beings are outside of the physical and the etheric body, hence in the time between falling asleep and awakening, they constantly have the desire for the physical body. They would like to return to the physical body. They are drawn out of the physical body by the powers of the cosmos, and only when those powers let them go again do they slide back into the physical body when they wake up. Then their desire for the physical body is satisfied once again. In the case of a person like Goethe, healthy sleep is present because the desire for the physical body is less than with many other people, and hence the influences from the cosmos during sleep are greater than with other people. A person like Goethe is more sensitive to the influences of the cosmos during sleep, and that constitutes his healthy sleep. The desire for the physical body is indeed present, but healthier than with other people. And why is it healthier? It is healthier precisely because while awake, Goethe was given over in such a healthy way to the impressions of the outer world. Because, for example, he was not content to put something theoretical like oscillations in the place of colors, but instead observed the colors themselves in their full-blooded reality. When a person like Goethe walks through nature, and although he is full of all kinds of wisdom, looks at the content directly as color, sees the green as green, the violet as violet, and the relation of green to violet or to yellow, it is different from when a dry theoretician walks through the field and does not see the colors, but rather speculates about how many billion or million oscillations correspond to green or red or yellow. Why does such a dried-out theoretician walk through the world in this way? He is not devoted to the world of color, because he is too strongly devoted to the physical body, even when it is primarily his own physical brain. All gray theories arise from an overly strong devotion to the physical body during daytime wakefulness. We would not have all the materialistic theories today if people were not so strongly devoted to the physical body. The more people expressly and selflessly give themselves over to the content of the world during wakeful life, the more they have the possibility of being devoted to the influences of the extraterrestrial cosmos during sleep, and of bringing back the healthy after-effects of these impressions into daytime life. Then they will not, like desiccated physicists, assume there to be swirls of atoms behind the streaming colors, but rather spirit, elemental spirituality, the real effectiveness of the spirit. To know that the living spiritual world is behind the impressions of the senses is an after-effect of healthy sleep. But when people during daytime wakefulness cannot be selflessly given over to what streams outside in the world and instead form dreadful theories about it that are actually phantasms, then they receive while sleeping a stronger, overpowering impulse toward the physical body. 
their consciousness is not only dimmed toward the impressions of sleep, but also the intensity and strength of these impressions themselves is diminished. The more spiritual science takes hold of human spiritual life, the more such bodies of wisdom as Goethean physics will take hold of people, as opposed to the grey theories that now pursue their mischief in external science. The acceptance of spiritual science by humanity has many connections. It will have tremendous meaning when the general consciousness is permeated with the truth that by night you are a human being within the extraterrestrial universe in a spiritual way, and by day you dive under into your physical and etheric bodies. One will learn to perceive and feel so much in connection with this knowledge. So, moving on to something more spiritual, what we call living with the spirit of a people, with the soul of the people among whom we count ourselves, must also be present when we dive under into the human physical and etheric bodies. Living together with the soul of the people is present from awakening until going to sleep. For what the soul of a people is, what it develops in forces and activities, is poured into the physical and etheric bodies. Into the physical body, more factors associated with ethnicity or culture, and into the etheric body, more factors having to do with the people. It is poured into those sheaths, which we enter when we awaken. In this way we are actually with our own folk soul, constantly in the exchange of forces. The science belonging to humanity at large has nothing to do with the configurations and differentiations poured into people through the folk souls. And this knowledge must be gained from the aspect of human nature that can make itself free and independent from the physical, as a person is independent from it in sleep. This science necessarily belongs to humanity in general, because it is attained with the parts of human nature that are independent from the physical and etheric bodies. To assume that a person who can really look into and gain knowledge of the spiritual world could be bound by national prejudices is simply an inappropriate way to consider the secrets of initiation. Although life in sleep, in the previously mentioned cases, is entirely different than it is in the waking state, they are related to each other in a way that is connected with the relationship of human beings to the nature of the soul and the culture of a people. From going to sleep until awakening, Individuals are not connected with the forces that emerge directly from the soul of their people, for those forces can be sent only into the physical and etheric bodies. Therefore those who have brought these forces to the conscious inner experience of their eye and astral body are, while experiencing them, outside their physical and etheric bodies. They are having this experience outside the physical and etheric bodies. Nonetheless, they are not outside the world. As soon as human beings slip into their physical body, and with that also into their etheric body, they are together specifically with the spirit of their people. And when they slip out of the physical and etheric bodies, as in sleep or initiation, they are outside the spirit of their own people, which does its work in the physical and etheric bodies. They are outside, but not entirely outside, the encircling dance of the folk souls, which are spiritual beings, after all. And when human beings are outside the physical and etheric bodies in the spiritual world, they are really outside of one individual folk soul, which, in the present, has a specific meaning for them in particular. They are outside their own folk soul, the one that affects their physical and the etheric bodies. 
because they are in their folk soul's company, or come into it in the waking state, the interest in it disappears in sleep and during initiation. The peculiar fact thus emerges that in sleep and during initiation individual human beings are substantially together with the souls of other peoples but not with their own. If you imagine yourself then in the encircling dance of contemporary folk souls you are as a human being together with your own folk soul when you perceive in the physical body and when you are awake. Conversely, when you are in a state of sleep or a state of initiation, you are together with all other folk souls, only not with your own. That is an objective truth. Now, you can get an idea from this of how senseless it would be if people who can consciously be together with other folk souls were to misjudge those folk souls or to burden them with sympathy or antipathy. That would be as if one did not want to recognize folk souls. Only for those who have not progressed as far as initiation does it make sense to harbor sympathy or antipathy for this or that folk soul, because they indeed do not know that they are actually together with the other souls for the sleeping half of their life. But there is a difference. While we are connected with our own folk soul in waking life, we are connected to the other folk souls in sleeping life, and hence connected not with the effects that proceed from only one, but rather with the common effect of the other folk souls, with what the others carry out as an encircling dance, working together in harmony. Therefore, you can imagine life both with just one of the folk souls and life with the other folk souls. The former is life in the waking state, the other life in sleep. During sleep or during initiation, one is together with the common work of the other folk souls. We cannot be with our own folk soul exclusively unless we constantly stay awake. It is quite impossible for us because we would have to stay awake all the time. The difference is that we exchange forces with our own folk soul in a waking state, while in a sleeping state the exchange is not with our own but with the totality, with the encircling dance of the other folk souls. However, there is a way to be together with a particular folk soul even in sleep to be more influenced by the powers coming from one soul and not from the totality of the folk souls. For in sleep one is usually banned, in a way, from this one folk soul. The method consists of especially hating the folk soul in the waking state. By hating a folk soul during the waking state you tear it out of the encircling dance of the other folk souls and ban it fettering yourself to its particular characteristics. To express myself in a trivial way, to really hate the soul of a people in a waking state means to condemn oneself to be obliged to sleep with the spirit of that nation. That is an esoteric truth, if also a disturbing one. It is nothing to laugh about. You must keep an eye on this if you wish to gain an understanding from a certain angle of how spiritual science, while it spreads over the world, must influence the attitude of people, must permeate all sense and feeling. I have purposely couched what I have to say about the relationship of human beings to the folk soul in an expression that makes you laugh. I had to do that because as an esotericist one very often tries to help out with regard to what is most disturbing, most tragic. One does not say it in its full tragic weight, for that would depress people, but rather says it in such a way that it helps people to take it in like any other scientific concept. For that reason, the fact must not be ignored that spiritual science shows us in a quite thorough way how far we are willing to accept the world as Maya. 
For as soon as we penetrate spiritual science with the deepest seriousness, it becomes serious. It, and everything it ought to be for human beings, becomes deeply serious. Today most people still have something against spiritual science because they cannot understand with their intellect what spiritual science really makes of the human being. People today do not understand the basic nerve of spiritual science. and Not only because they cannot understand it with their intellect, there is something much deeper. When we penetrate deeper into the wisdoms of spiritual science, it makes demands on our mind and on our will. It shows us the human being in a light in which we usually are not willing to take ourselves. It is not just our intellect that would rather turn to maya than to reality, but the will also. If I may speak in a trivial way once again, it is extremely uncomfortable to live with the deeper wisdom of spiritual science, because life must receive another face under the influence of spiritual science. The moment one knows what it means when Capacius and Schrader stand opposite one another on the stage of life in their spiritual forms and exchange words that in truth bring about tumult and noise in the most elemental forces of the world, the moment one knows what is going on in the world, in the entire cosmos, when a person experiences this or that in the soul, then the whole seriousness of spiritual science reveals itself. And one finally understands how people want not only to live with a full understanding of maya, but also actually to live simply with the will in maya. We need only to develop this or that sympathy or this or that aversion, and what we do because of that aversion becomes the reason we are driven as sleeping or dead human beings into the region of this or that being in the cosmos and bring about this or that event in place of another. For through our communion with this or that being in the cosmos, cosmic events happen in their turn. Such statements are intended to evoke a feeling of how spiritual science really does not wish to speak only to people's intellect, but rather to the entire human being. It wishes to take hold of the entire soul. This is because our life is today at a stage in which the signs of the times show us clearly how we are to take hold of life, if it is to go on. They point out that that wave which contains spiritual secrets and does not leave us in the Maya, but leads us into true reality. Those are the things we must consider if we wish to come to a deeper understanding of our spiritual scientific will. <laughs>